Hi everyone, my name is Ben Leeds Carson and you might know me as a professor uh, of music at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and if you've uh, got to this video, you might even know me as um, the music historian that uh, Dion Lim interviewed at ABC7 in San Francisco last week um, when they were curious to get some perspectives on the classic almost Christmas song, Baby It's Cold Outside. Um, you probably know that it was censored by a few radio stations um, and then apparently was brought back on the air by popular demand. And so um, I'm kind of uh, interested in talking a little bit more about that today because I'm preparing to teach a class in the winter uh, popular music in the United States and this is pretty relevant. And I had some more thoughts on the topic so I thought I might um, get ready for the class by doing a little video blogging on the subject. Now you might love this song, or, or you might not. If you love it, um, it might be because it's just, it's a very charming song. There's a lot to love about it. It's a pressurized kind of dialogue, but it's very playful and affectionate. And uh, it's a dispute usually between a man and a woman. And I think part of what charms us is that a romantic couple is singing in counterpoint, meaning you can hear their two melodies interlocking in, a, in an unlikely but a kind of a lovely uh, sort of a way. And it's not just that they interlock note to note, it's not just the sonorous kind of a sweetness that you sometimes hear in the interval between the notes of the two voices, um, but it's also, like all counterpoint, it's a rhythmic push and pull. So sometimes you get a performance where, where the opening line is very purposeful and straightforward. It feels like it's really on the beat and there's a sense of directiveness to it, like, I really can't stay. And then the pushback from that second character will be syncopated uh, like this. But baby, it's cold outside. And by syncopated, I just mean that the emphasized notes sometimes go against the grain of the rhythm. So it'll sound like there's a contrast and a push and pull between the, the two singers, not just because one of them's interrupting one another, but because the interruption shifts the kind of sense of pulse in the music. So I really can't stay, but baby, it's cold outside. I've got to go away, but baby, it's cold outside. So, um, and then it's just really, really pretty to hear them come together to conclude these, these long uh, sentences at the end of a kind of two phrases. It's like a musical sentence, and they've got this very simple point where they come together, and it's very evocative. Um, you know, the, the lower part is usually cold outside, while the upper part will be baby, it's cold outside. And I really love hearing Ella and Louis, that's uh, Louis Jordan, not Louis Armstrong. Uh, but Ella and Louis Jordan singing that, when they lock together their voices, they have a really special kind of energy to them. So it's kind of like, you know, you just want to go inside somewhere and get warm. And it's, it's just, it's easy to understand why with this musical sound, why the music would be so compelling to so many people. Um, how could anyone dare to sort of ask us to give up this song? But if you scroll through a Google, uh, if you scroll th through a Google search, um, you'll see people have been blogging about this all the way back to 2004. Um, it's been spoofed on SNL by Tina Fey and Kenan Thompson. Uh, there's a Funny or Die spoof. Flash forward to 2016. Um, you might know Andrew Reynolds from the Book of Mormon, and he tweeted a recommendation that we semi-retire the song or at least stop recording it. Um, and then maybe you know, a year later in response to Me Too, there's been a rising movement to just take the song out of circulation. And it's, it's reached a high point this season. Um, but then, like I said, something unexpected happened. And after radio stations in San Francisco and Cleveland took it off the air, a wave, this wave of popular support for the song led to, to some campaigns to bring it back, back as though it had really gone away. And it wasn't really the wave that I would have expected. I want to say it was um, a bipartisan wave. Um, you might call it the Trumposphere, I guess, that resents uh, a certain level of uh, intentional thinking about how power works in relationships especially between men and women. Uh, but then there are also quite a lot of feminist defenses or self-proclaimed feminist defenses of the song. Um, uh, the most notable one, I think, the one that gets cited a lot, um, it dates back to 2006 in an article by, uh, the pen name is Slaybell with Slay spelled S-L-A-Y, kind of cool, in this, um, in this daily blog called Persephone, which is centered on 
women in popular culture, among other things. And um, so Sleigh Bell's uh, defense of the song, is, as well as something from a blues blogger named uh, Big Butter and Eggman, um, are both seen as feminist defenses, and they get echoed on BuzzFeed and on Vanity Fair and on the Washington Post. People are sort of trying to resurrect the song, maybe from a kind of a reputation of being a signifier of rape culture. Um, and so I've been reading and listening to these points of view and others ever since my interview on ABC, and I decided to go kind of look back at the song again and ask, so what is this song really saying? Um, and uh, for some people, the heart of that question goes back to what the artist intended. And there are some, some really cool things to discover here. The children of the songwriter have weighed in, and, and his niece, Karen North is a professor specializing in popular culture, uh, like, like I do, um, and she teaches at the University of Southern California. Uh, so Karen, in some interviews, has shared a glimpse of the composer's heart, um, of his love of entertainment and uh, a kind of warm, creative vision. And so from that, we can learn something uh, really valuable. We learn something about what this creative visionary thought about dating in the 1940s. Um, there are some other exciting avenues to follow, too, uh, if we're looking at the author's intentions. For example, instead of writing man and woman, the songwriter Frank Lesser, um, he just wrote wolf and mouse, which, um, you know, at first that kind of you, you're taken aback. You're thinking, oh, is, are we going to be that sort of on the nose about a predatory relationship between man and woman? And of course, it doesn't prove that he intended us for us to think uh, about it in a predatory way, but it does show that at least for this author, the metaphor works, that trying to persuade someone to be your lover is like hunting, I guess. Um, and maybe we still have that worldview today. Maybe, sadly, that, that metaphor still works um, for some people. We also know that he developed the song with his first wife, Lynn Garland, and we can listen to a recording. I encourage you to um, actually listen to a recording of the two of them singing. So when I hear Lynn's voice, I actually learn something about the complexity of the song for her. And she, she channels a tone that feels more seductive and seems to have more agency than some of the interpretations of her, of her contemporaries. So despite the, the innocence of her words uh, she sings, uh, it does feel like she's in control. And that's, uh, that's going to be an integral part of this uh, the sort of defense um, that we hear. So uh, one of the really cool... Uh, analyses uh, of the song comes to us from Helen Rosner, um, um, who a few years back sort of decided to strip away the wolf's words and looked at just the mouse alone. She showed that the song is, um, and these are her words, that it's, quote, clearly about a sexually aware woman worried about slut shaming. And she even went as far as to say that if you disagree with her, you're, you're denying the woman, her agency, that you're, you're part of the problem. And, and that makes a lot of sense, at least, at least technically. Um, when I talk to friends about this song, regardless of their gender, that the song does seem to describe a woman, or possibly a non-female mouse, I guess, um, taking the only agency that is socially acceptable for her to take. So one point of view on the song is, that, I mean, it's, it's a point of view that's rooted, I think, in, in some important third wave um, feminist ideas, says, you know, if this is her power, we'll, you know, we'll let her have that. If this is the power that a woman can take in the 1940s, it's, it's preposterous to sort of judge it for being uh, complex in some way or to suggest that she should try for some other kind of power that, that she can't have. And, and I, actually, I think I hear that kind of power in Lynn Garland's voice. And if I'm right in hearing that, it might also help us understand why, um, you know, she has an autobiography, um, the songwriter's first wife, and she describes feeling betrayed um, when um, the song was sold to the studios, when Frank so sold the song to the studios. To her, it was, a, it was a, no better than finding out that a lover had lied and cheated because to her, this was, the song was a collaboration. Uh, she was a part of making it what it was. She felt that they owned it together. And that kind of reminds me of the cheating and the lies that men tell, the lies that men tell women in movies like Neptune's Daughter. Um, you know, in order to, to drive forward a comic plot where every character has to find a good mate and to resolve romantic tensions into sort of morally acceptable relationships, um, this movie is really about deception. And it's not that uncommon. A lot of comedies involve mistaken identity and then exploitations of mistaken identity and 
deceptions out of fear and embarrassment and then coming back and apologizing and all as well. So the deception is a big part of how the song works. So in addition to Sleigh Bell's uh, defense of the song, uh, which focuses a lot on how we can reinterpret um, the say what's in this drink line, we also have this really cool analysis of the song that comes to us from, uh, from Helen Rosner. Now, now, what these two defenses have in common, just in, in, in broad terms, is that in both cases, we're looking at a woman who is seeking intimacy. And I, I think the theory is that when she says things like, oh, you've been lovely and, and your welcome has been so warm, it's been a lovely night, thank you for, for your hospitality, that she's, she's being sincere and she's sincerely letting on that she really likes this guy. She's letting on to the chemistry between them. And that when she says things like the uh, I, I really must go and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm worried about what people will think of me, um, that uh, she's kind of navigating a complex social system in which she will eventually say yes. So when she says the answer is no, she's eventually going to kind of change her mind. So that's all plausible. Um, but we also have to consider the opposite. We have to be able to imagine that a person in this situation is just being polite or fearful when she pays him a compliment and that when she says no, it really means no. So when I put all of this stuff together, um, it really starts to remind me of Barbara Ehrenreich's argument in her 1987 book, The Hearts of Men. Uh, in this book, she sees the development of feminism in the 1960s not as a sudden rebellion of women against ancient patriarchy, but as a rebellion against something very particular that happens after World War II, which is that men suddenly don't care about marriage and the whole system of gender relations that marriage entails uh, in the way that they once did. So from Aaron Reich's point of view, we can see in the 30s and earlier uh, a wage-sharing, what she calls a wage-sharing civilization, which wasn't great for women, but moral codes shared by women and men ensured a certain amount of security and certain kinds of freedom, certain kinds of stability. Um, and she argues that in the post-war economic boom, American men, and she uses both high modern poets of the beat generation like Ginsburg's Howell, and also just dime store pulp fiction novels and sci-fi uh, to demonstrate this. She demonstrates that American men suddenly regarded a domestic partner as a luxury or a nuisance and as an aesthetic pleasure at best, but no longer an essential collaboration. Um, and so essentially we're seeing an economic transformation of the United States and of other parts of the world in which masculinity gets a whole lot of new freedoms, but leaves femininity behind and leaves, um, well, I should say, leaves women and their relationships to men and their traditional relationships to men in a very strange situation where essentially men have divested from uh, that traditional role. So that's what happens first from Aaron Reich's point of view and feminism happens later. Here we are in 1949. Let's, let's look at the social restrictions that are faced by the mouse in uh, Baby It's Cold Outside uh, restrictions that a woman has to obey, but mostly a man doesn't. And that's actually part of the defense of this song is that she's making use of the man's freedom in order to get what she wants. So we want to notice that the fundamental lesson of the song might be that regardless of whether you like it or not, that men and women play by different rules. She's still stuck in the chivalry system. She's bound to be amiable and demure in ways that reflect her dependency upon that system. But meanwhile, he's in a brand new world. That chivalry system would have made the wolf's behavior an embarrassment to both parties. But now the man is in a new world, a world that's mostly left women behind. And I think we'd be right uh, with the Me Too movement to consider that we're still in that world today and that this song actually isn't um, a historical oddity. It isn't um, far removed from where we are, but actually expresses something very serious about the difference in power between men and women. So uh, let's just think about how that works musically. So, I mean, we have a relationship that moves into the second phrase here. The second phrase of the song actually is, it's very common for contrasting phrases, either the second or the third phrase of a song. This is an A, B, A, C form for those of you who are following, which is like the second most common form in the Tin Pan Alley tradition. 
it's like similar to all of me and and um, Irving Berlin's always, um, but it's it's in the minority. It's a, it's a, it's not an A A B A like you'd think that standard thirty two bar form that's so important to jazz. Um, and so, but we've got the se- like most contrasting phrases. The second phrase where she sings, "My mother will start to worry. My father will be pacing the floor." We're moving to instead of the home key, which we've been moving through in a sort of systematic way, we suddenly kind of temporarily find a new place. There's always a departure. This happens in the second phrase of the blues, the third phrase of a standard bridge in a, in a jazz standard, and it's happening in the second phrase here. Um, when she sings, my mother will start to worry, my father will be pacing the floor, she's maintaining a kind of a, a musically steady kind of wall against some advancing problem. You can feel this feeling of pushing back there's this sort of equilibrium that's formed between them right there, just sort of holding pattern on this, what we call the subdominant. It doesn't matter too much what it's called, but it's a feeling of, oh, we're departing. We're moving away from the home key. And she sings, you know, my mother will start to worry. And he pushes back, baby, what's your hurry? My father will be pacing the floor. The harmony is kind of different here, depending on which interpretation. My father will be pacing the floor. But really, I better scurry. Well, maybe just a cigarette, maybe just a cigarette more. The neighbors might think. So, um, as this as this intensifies with a sort of holding pattern on this different point in the harmony, you can feel the man's freedom from this. This is the first time in history, I think, where a, a man doesn't really need to regard that system or that way of thinking about gender relations as as something that's essential to his well-being and in fact he can really find a lot of advantages in dismissing it so um, it's probably time for me to put a little of myself on the table here I, I want to make it clear that um, so the perspectives that I have on this song I really I don't feel like that I'm, I'm in a position to say what the song should mean to anyone or whether we should listen to it or why um, because the song pertains to uh, relationships that I'm often in the traditionally dominant perspective in. Um, I, I have been a victim of sexual violence uh, by a, a man that I respected and feared. And this is something that I wrote about in a Medium post last year. Uh, I won't spend time on it here except to say that I can relate to what critics hear in the role of the mouse in Baby It's Cold Outside. I can relate to the experience of being cornered, and I know that when you're cornered late at night, it's not as simple as just running away. Um, It's usually by somebody that you know. Um, Someone's making sexual demands of you that you also have a lot of other things invested in your relationship with this person. And I, 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 in my case, and in most cases like this, you value the person in some way, or at least you had up and Till this confrontation and you don't want the extraordinary cost that's involved in becoming this person's enemy. You, 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 you do say nice things to avoid anger. You compliment and you bargain. So I've even felt that I've had to hide the crime of a, of a relentless hours-long ordeal in order to protect, like the mouse in the song, to protect my reputation in a community that actually loved and admired my aggressor. And, and, and that's probably the situation that, that the char- Jose character played by Ricardo Montalban is created um, in, this, in this first popular version of the song. You know, in, in the movie, he's a celebrity athlete um, with whom the main character, Eve, has a, has a business arrangement. You know, so I, I come to this with a sense of something being important. I have something at stake in thinking about this issue, but it also needs to be said that I, I don't have experiences of sexual aggression that are like what a lot of women have. I, I don't have experiences that span an entire life and are often tied deeply to a way of life or an occupation. I don't have experiences of it being pervasive in the world and also that my sort of everyday life depends on how I navigate those things. Um, those experiences often determine a great deal more about power and freedom in the world than my experiences did. So so um, it is a different place that I come from. 
but there's something at stake in it. Um, so it's with that in mind that, that I actually really want to turn to a wide variety of perspectives, including Karen North, the niece of, of the songwriter, and, and Sleigh Bell and Helen Rosner, um, with questions and not debates. So the first, but I do feel like as an educator, I need to ask questions of the interpretations that I'm hearing as the song gets defended. And the first question is, what did the song mean to audiences who made it popular? If we want to know what a song means, to me, the first issue actually isn't what Lesser and Garland intended. In any way, we can actually never really know exactly what Frank Lesser intended because his wolf mouse experiences in his life, you know, I mean, authors are notoriously unreliable witnesses about things like their own um, rape fantasies. So we, we can't get very far with that question. We don't, we don't simply hear, um, a relative of the songwriter say, oh, he was, a really, he was a really lovely man and he only wanted to make people happy. We don't hear that and say, oh, well, then therefore he had no part in rape culture. That's not, that's, we can't make that. That's not, a, that's not a, a connection that you can make. But we can actually, we do have the power to learn a lot about how an audience has decided to value a song, what values and meanings they've attached to it. And answering that question is one of the deepest purposes and actually one of the most, the most fulfilling purposes that you can have in the study of popular music. Studying why we value songs, what values they hold for us, and, and why they mean something to us, uh, and what those meanings are. So the beginning of the, that answer might be in the film Neptune's Daughter, because although the song was written in 44, it's really in 1949 with that film that the song has its mass cultural meaning. It's only then that we get to actually think about what does the song, what does it become? So watch how Montalban sings the beginning of the song. So when he begins the song, Montalban uh, he actually emphasizes the strong beat, baby, it's cold outside, with physically grabbing Esther Williams' arm and destabilizing her so that she has to fall back to the couch and then right in rhythm but baby it's cold outside he, he does it a second time the second baby he has the same strong beat pulling her back to the couch and this time the second time he raises his hand his other hand and he steadily pushes her shoulder back so that she's not only she's already been pushed down to sit but now she has to recline um, the pattern continues throughout the song in other forms. Um, she puts on an article of clothing and he's got the freedom to just take it right off of her. He has the freedom to touch her and move her body in, in a lot of ways without encountering... Um, well, she, he encounters a lot of physical resistance, but without a lot of um, punishment. He gets to just keep doing it. Um, so, and this is, this is a really hard scene for a lot of people to watch. We can imagine, it's, it's not that this necessarily proves that the intention of the song is violent, but because we can imagine this kind of jostling and, and wrestling is welcomed by some people in some circumstances, some of the time. But in the view of a cinematic audience, it becomes a different kind of force. It's not merely an aggression between uh, characters, but it's a demonstration of what kinds of power belong to the mice, which is the power that involves something like da -da -ba -da 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 a tentative kind of holding pattern against a wall and the kinds of power that belong to the wolves in the audience something along the lines of ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -da 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 this really resolute kind of first you're syncopated and free and then you're like forcefully moving forward into the next phrase of the song where she sings the neighbors might say and some of us are watching the movie and we're listening to a beautiful, affectionate song. We share so much joy with the others in the audience, knowing that they're charmed by it, just to be there with them. It's a co communal experience. We're listening as feminists. We're listening as confused, unrequited lovers. We're listening as excited carolers or shoppers at a mall. And, and while we're listening, we're learning what to do. We're learning what to say. Um, and if we love the song, it's because We've embraced ourselves as mice and wolves in this scene. Um, I have another question for defenders of the song, um, which I'll try to be a little bit more brief on, um, which is to ask, and this is especially to, to Helen Rosner, which is ask whether something's lost when we try imagining and understanding a woman's agency by stripping away the context of the words to which she's responding. Well, certainly something is really gained in Rosner's uh, analysis. This was a really powerful approach because it enabled us to see the continuity 
uh, in the movie. So we see Eve as a character, as a whole woman, as a result of, of Rosner's analysis. We see a woman who's attracted to a man, and he may be acting like a fool, but she's steady, and she thanks him for the warm hospitality, and she acknowledges that they have chemistry, and then she politely insists on leaving. So thanks to Helen's exercise, we actually get to see a certain kind of agency, but I get tripped up on this. And my question is, I think, I think the word agency means the ability to determine an outcome. So I need help finishing the sentence. Eve wants, Eve has the power to. And don't worry, it's, it's not just that she achieves it by saying no and presumably eventually changing her mind. The, the, the ability to change your mind about intimacy is maybe one of the most important kinds of power that you can have. But if we're going to call this agency on the part of Eve, we have to understand what she's got. And, and it's, it's basically she's been building a dialogue in which she can only have what the wolf decides to seek. So it's all at the initiative of the wolf. It's all about what he he might not want the same kind of intimacy that she wants. It has to be in his court. It has to be his way of saying, I want this, I'm doing this, and I'm suggesting this. So I'm not sure that that's really a very empowering or feminist reading. This is a world in which women are really not supposed to take initiative on their own behalf. And that point is actually really brought home in the song when the same movie, the gender roles are reversed for a different pair of characters. In the second version, um, the pursued man is still holding the cards. Um, he's deceived a woman about his identity for the sake of sexual opportunity. Um, and even regardless of that, the song reinforces gender roles with absurd comic relief. The story, for this to work, it requires a man-crazy woman. She's boy-crazy. It requires an ironic woman in pursuit who is an ungraceful, out-of-touch fool. We, we, only, we, we don't really become interested in her sincere pursuit of pleasure. Instead, She's portrayed as laughably unrequited and as dangerous to herself. And she's, we're laughing at her because she's not, making, she's, she's not understanding how things are supposed to work. Um, and meanwhile, for the women who follow the rules, desire um, seems to be the possible end of a long novel that never really gets past the first chapter. Um, the chapter in which she thinks first about her reputation, then about the egos of male companions when he asks, you know, what's the sense of hurting my pride or, or why would you do this thing to me? And finally, she's concerned about her own safety, but she's, she's never getting to the chapter where she gets to express what she wants affirmatively. Now, she confronts these expectations admirably um, in a passive way, but the question that we need to resolve in further discussion of this song is, is does the song celebrate that power when at the same time it seems to celebrate and relish the man's complete freedom from those constraints. So I look forward to having those discussions um, with all of my students in the class and, uh, and to any discussions that happen in this thread here. So thanks for listening and I uh, hope to see you next time. <laughs>